I can't really talk about cool clothes because I like Old Navy. You like Old Navy? <laughs> I like Old Navy, man. You want to be a big shot? Go take a hundred bucks to Old Navy. Walk in Old Navy with a hundred bucks? You become the mayor of Old Navy with a hundred bucks? You got a gold watch, a cigar, you're throwing t-shirts everywhere? You get 400 fucking t-shirts for 17 cents? It's exciting! I went crazy on graphic tees. I bought 40 fucking graphic tees from Old Navy. I bought a run DMC shirt from Old Navy. That's the most unrun DMC thing you can do. <laughs> Old Navy doesn't give a shit. I walked into Old Navy the other day. They had a sale just called Fuck It, Take It, whatever you want. Go ahead. <laughs> it's Old Navy. Who's watching? Fuck, who cares? I can't. Good morning. It's Tuesday, Trump Tuesday, July the 2nd. And this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the patriotic song of the day, we will have patriotic shorts, motivation, Bishop Barron, Ayn Rand, the 33 strategies of war, and Donald Trump. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I should not change, the courage to change the things I should, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Now, the headlines. Hey there, Cheryl. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm Ashley Webster in for Stu today. Let's get right to it. President Biden giving his first public address since his debate against former President Trump. He condemned the Supreme Court's immunity ruling in a five-minute scripted speech. And oh, yes, he ignored questions from reporters. Meanwhile, former President Trump moving to overturn his New York fraud conviction after the Supreme Court ruled presidents cannot be held criminally liable for official acts. And this afternoon, for the first time since the debate, the Biden administration will be taking questions at the White House. That should be interesting. It comes as Axios reveals that Biden's aides have given him a, quote, survival strategy after his poor debate performance, which includes calming donors, proving vitality, 
and warning about chaos. We'll see how that works out. Let's take a look at the markets for you. The Dow futures heading down. The Dow off nearly 100 points. S&P and Nasdaq also down about a half a percent. The Nasdaq, by the way, recorded a record close yesterday, the 21st of the year. Let's take a look at the 10-year yield, if we can. That, too, heading lower, down uh, nearly three basis points at 4.43%. Meanwhile, the two-year Treasury yield, where we are there, also down by one and a half basis points at 4.74%. And what about Bitcoin? We like to keep track of Bitcoin, see what that is doing. And yes, it is down slightly, 229 bucks at $62,774. On the show today, a judge dealing a major blow to the Biden administration's climate agenda after more than 20 states fought back. And four migrants do in court today. They're facing attempted murder charges after attacking and robbing a Chicago man on a train in broad daylight. And Fox has exclusive video of the attack. And get this, they all listed their home addresses that matched state-funded migrant shelters. It is Tuesday, July 2nd, 2024. And guess what? Varney and Company is about to begin. And that was the headline news. Well, headlines anyways. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, Hollywood. It was the first episode of season three of The Twilight Zone, and it contained virtually no dialogue. It was simply titled Two, and starred tough guy character actor Charles Bronson and a young Elizabeth Montgomery, who was still years away from her breakout role in the TV show Bewitched. It told the story of a planet in ruins from an atomic war, with the two forced into an uneasy alliance for survival. The script was written by Rod Serling himself, who had seen up close the devastation of war. Rod wanted Lizzie and me to depict the senselessness of war, reflected Bronson. With almost no dialogue, the actors had to convey their emotions through facial expressions and chemistry, something Montgomery excelled at. Charles could communicate the horrors of war through his eyes, Montgomery once noted. I saw that look with my father, too, when he returned from the war. Both Bronson and Montgomery's careers would take off within a few years, but both considered this episode among their finest work. I don't know. I'm not an intellectual. I know, as far as I know, my mom got a heart attack when she was, when I was eight years old. She was a young woman. And she came home and the doctor said, make her laugh. And I don't think I ever tried to make anyone laugh before then. But I thought I'd better try and make her laugh. And I did. I was successful. And I think, like most things, when you have that mother's confidence that you can do something, you think you can do it with everyone. Were you an only child? No, I had an older sister. Yeah. And you kept your mother, at least, you thought you kept your mother alive by, by amusing her. Do you know what's the hardest part for me um, with humor? I heard what you said to the audience. Yeah. Well, that hysterical fellow and that funny guy and so on, is that they'll think I'm going to be funny now, yeah. this moment. Now, I might be. I'm not saying I won't be. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> in Boston, before cell phone cameras and all of that stuff, if you took somebody's joke, that person came in and punched you out. There's a famous story about Tim Thomerson, who I never worked with. He was even older than me, if that's imaginable. The story was that when Robin Williams rest his soul and great guy but he might have had a tendency once in a while because he was on Mork and Mindy to hear something at the comedy store and perhaps it involuntarily got into the back of his head and then it would appear on Mork and Mindy and the story was that Tim Thomerson just walked into the comedy store one night and punched him in the face well I mean that's if you do shit like I mean and who said he was wrong I'm just saying. Yeah, that that's how that's how that shit was handled. It was but, it was like hockey. It was settled on the ice. <laughs> yeah. William Frawley was forced to play roles that made him miserable. When William Frawley joined I Love Lucy, he had a poor reputation. Many studio executives opposed his casting as Fred Mertz, urging Lucilla and Desi to find someone else. However, Desi, despite his own reservations, was adamant about hiring William for the role. William was hired for the show following Desi's gut instinct. But he was only given the role of Fred Mertz under the explicit condition that he would significantly reduce his alcohol consumption. This wasn't the sole unusual requirement. 
It's also been mentioned that the contract included provision freeing William from work obligations if the Brooklyn Dodgers reached the World Series. Lucille and Desi were delighted to accommodate William's love for sports as long as he upheld his end of the deal by consistently delivering strong performances on the show. While William undoubtedly delivered excellent performances, portraying Fred Mertz as a stand-up character, it's evident that he struggled with sobriety during filming. I Dream of Jeannie, a classic sitcom that aired from 1965 to 1970, captivated audiences with the romantic tension between Barbara Eaton's Jeannie and Larry Hagman's major Tony Nelson. This chemistry was a key factor in the show's enduring popularity. What many didn't know was that there was a different kind of tension behind the scenes. Larry Hagman, the son of Broadway star Mary Martin, had dreams of stardom and was determined to control every aspect of the show, according to Barbara Eaton. Larry Hagman also had an unpredictable temper and struggled with drinking and drug use. His antics included showing up to work in a gorilla suit and squaring while swinging an axe when visitors from the Flying Nun set came over. Despite their differences, Barbara Eden and Larry Hagman agreed on one thing. They didn't want their characters to marry in the fifth season, knowing it would likely lead to the show's cancellation. The show only lasted for 15 more episodes. Larry was so upset that he spent the final season hiding in his trailer and refusing to talk to anyone. You... And that was Hollywood. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the uh, military shorts. A U.S. nuclear submarine popped up in the Norwegian Sea in a show of force. And the USS Tennessee can carry up to 20 nuclear weapons. And it's traveling with an E-6B Mercury, a.k.a. the Doomsday Plane, which handles nuclear command and control for the president. And the U.S. 6th Fleet let this be known on Twitter with no intention being given for the revelation. Though some have speculated, like Kendrick said, sometimes you just gotta pop and show them. And notably, a nuclear missile launched from the coast of Norway can reportedly reach Moscow in less than two minutes. So as one analyst put it, it's a blunt signal to Russia. And this is tensions between the two were the highest they've been since the fall of 2022. And all of this coming as the U.S. has suspended all sales of the Patriot missile system, with them now sending all of them to Ukraine instead, and also allowing them to strike inside of Russia with U.S. weapons. The military's new manta ray by Northrop Grumman has just been spotted. Once this is ready, nobody will mess with the USA. This is Manta Ray, an unmanned underwater vehicle that has been in development for over four years, with the design inspired by the fish. The Manta Ray is crazy. It can operate on its own for a long time, cover long distances across the world, and carry giant payloads. It's made to run on energy from the ocean, and it can even sit at the bottom of the ocean to save power. With this technology, it can go on risky missions without any help from humans. But that's not the best part. The Manta Ray has a wingspan of up to nine meters and it glides through water using small propellers. This year, the prototype has already had tests that have been a success. However, the manta ray has had problems like seawater corrosion and even marine life that keep attaching themselves to the outside of the vehicle. These worries will not be a problem when it launches. In November 1941, an important meeting took place at the Kummersdorf Proving Ground near Berlin, attended by Heinz Guderian, Ferdinand Porsche, Friedrich Paulus, and other members of the German general staff. They were present for the test firing on a captured Soviet T-34 tank. The tank was a surprise to the German command and a failure for Abwehr. During the firing from POC-38 and POC-40 anti-tank guns, the T-34 suffered only minor track damage. The only effective weapon against it was the 80 enemy or Flak 18 anti-aircraft gun. The T-34's aluminum V-shaped diesel engine with 500 horsepower also impressed. This was unexpected for the Germans, as diesel engines were invented in Germany. Yet by the end of the war, German manufacturers had not managed to create a tank diesel engine, making their tanks vulnerable to Molotov cocktails. The main producer of the T-34 at that time was the Stalingrad tractor plant. Why did the Viet Cong's AK-47s explode during the Vietnam War? Let's just say American Special Forces had something to do with it. To shatter confidence in the enemy, one member of the highly classified Studies and Observations Group had the genius idea to booby-trap the enemy weapon and ammunition supply. They pried open captured ammunition cans and replaced some of the ammo with bullets loaded with extra gunpowder, causing the rifles to explode when shot. Eventually, the unit managed to manufacture over 12,000 sabotage bullets, mortars, and various rifles, distributing them to enemy supply depots across the country and on the bodies of dead soldiers in hopes other fighters would scavenge the ammo. They then spread rumors that Chinese manufacturers were knowingly shipping the tainted ammo, hoping to stir trouble between the two communist powers. Doc Friend went to go get me his his last morphine um, shot, I guess. 
We only had one left because of the amount of casualties we had had up until that point on deployment. He went to go uh, administer that last morphine shot, and the very small and fragile needle caught that combat gauze on my leg, and it bent it, and he wasn't uh, able to administer it. And now, after going through the steps of the medevac process and back to the United States, not only did we learn that I had to be resuscitated three times, but when I arrived at the combat trauma hospital, I was labeled PEA, which is pulseless electrical activity. And uh, they told me that if I would have received any morphine, that it would have depressed my respiratory system to the point of being unrecoverable. And that was the military shorts. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, a little bit of motivation. The greatest shame for a Spartan was to return home alive from a lost battle. So, too, do not return from a challenge having not given everything. Only consume plain food and never eat to the point of satisfaction. This will not only bring about a leanness for battle, but also foster mental fortitude. Seek out intense competition. You will push yourself much harder. Every Spartan should undergo a rite of passage, a physical or mental trial. Once completed, you are born again, better than ever. Strength and agility are less essential than stamina, grit, endurance, and courage. Accepting death will allow you to live your life courageously. It unshackles the mind from the limitations of fear, bringing forth your true potential. Do not engage in gossip. Only engage in conversation that will nourish and strengthen your spirit. Fight for a good cause. Use every ounce of your being to push that cause further. And do not be afraid to defend it. Surround yourself with people who are ruthlessly devoted to becoming their greatest selves. A leader does not watch on safely from the rear. Continuously introduce yourself to difficult situations where you are forced to either sink or swim. A great Spartan must have the ability to quickly adapt. Partake in structured, organized, and well-respected training programs, ensuring you see them through to the finish. Refuse to be a victim of circumstance. Learn to be self-reliant and prepared for any situation. Find ways to implement short bursts of discomfort into your daily life. This will ensure growth and prevent you from falling into sloth. Dedicate yourself to perpetual physical training, regardless of circumstance and feelings. And that was a little bit of motivation. Thank you, thank you. Now, the Daily Stoic. What we control and what we don't. Some things are in our control, while others are not. We control our opinion, choice, desire, aversion, and, in a word, everything of our own doing. We don't control our body, property, reputation, position, and, in a word, everything not of our own doing. Even more, the things in our control are by nature free, unhindered, and unobstructed. 
while those not in our control are weak, slavish, can be hindered, and are not our own. Epictetus, Enchiridion, 1.1 through 2. Today, you won't control the external events that happen. Is that scary? A little, but it's balanced when we see that we can control our opinion about those events. You decide whether they're good or bad, whether they're fair or unfair. You don't control the situation, but you control what you think about it. See how that works? Every single thing that is outside your control, the outside world, other people, luck, karma, whatever, still presents a corresponding area that is in your control. This alone gives us plenty to manage, plenty of power. Best of all, an honest understanding of what is within our control provides real clarity about the world. All we have is our own mind. Remember that today when you try to extend your reach outward, that it's much better and more appropriately directed inward. And that was uh, the Daily Stoic. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. Now, Bishop Robert Barron. Many, many of us are familiar with the phenomenon of addiction, whether it's it's alcohol or it's to drugs or it's to sex or pornography. All forms of sin are really forms of uh, addiction. When you're caught in addiction, what can't you do? You can't save yourself from it, right? Think of, think of the 12-step programs. The key move in all the 12-step programs is to admit your powerlessness and to turn your life over to a higher power. That's born of Christianity, everybody, that insight. If you say, look, I'm powerless over this addiction, and the more I try through my own efforts to make it right, the worse I'm going to make it. Turn your life over to a higher power. Only in that way are you going to be saved. Thank you, thank you. Now, the Ayn Rand thought of the day. Quote, politically, the draft is clearly unconstitutional. No amount of rationalization, neither by the Supreme Court nor by private individuals, can alter the fact that it represents involuntary servitude. A volunteer army is the only proper, moral, and practical way to defend a free country. Should a man volunteer to fight if his country is attacked? Yes if he values his own rights and freedom, unquote. And that was the quote of the day from Ayn Rand. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the 33 strategies of war. The problem that many of us face is that we have great dreams and ambitions. Caught up in the emotions of our dreams and the vastness of our desires, we find it very difficult to focus on the small, tedious steps usually necessary to attain them. We tend to think in terms of giant leaps toward our goals. But in the social world, as in nature, anything of size and stability grows slowly. The piecemeal strategy is the perfect antidote to our natural impatience. It focuses us on something small and immediate, a first bite. Then, how and where a second bite can get us closer to our ultimate objective. It forces us to think in terms of a process, a sequence of connected steps and actions, no matter how small, which has immeasurable psychological benefits as well. Too often the magnitude of our desires overwhelms us. Taking that small first step makes them seem realizable. There is nothing more therapeutic than action. In plotting this strategy, be attentive to sudden opportunities and to your enemy's momentary crises and weaknesses. Do not be tempted, however, to try to take anything large. Bite off more than you can chew and you will be consumed with problems and disproportionately discouraged if you fail to cope with them. 
The fait accompli strategy is often the best way to take control of a project that would be ruined by divided leadership. In almost every film Alfred Hitchcock made, he had to go through the same wars, gradually wresting control of the film from the producer, the actors, and the rest of the team. His struggles with screenwriters were a microcosm of the larger war. Hitchcock always wanted his vision for a film to be exactly reflected in the script. But too firm a hand on his writer's neck would get him nothing except resentment and mediocre work. So instead, he moved slowly, starting out by giving the writer room to work loosely off his notes, then asking for revisions that shaped the script his way. His control became obvious only gradually, and by that time the writer was emotionally tied to the project and, however frustrated, was working for his approval. A very patient man, Hitchcock let his power plays unfold over time so that producer, writer, and stars understood the completeness of his domination only when the film was finished. To gain control of any project, you must be willing to make time your ally. If you start out with complete control, you sap people's spirit and stir up envy and resentment. So begin by generating the illusion that you're all working together on a team effort. Then, slowly nibble away. If in the process you make people angry, do not worry. That's just a sign that their emotions are engaged, which means they can be manipulated. Finally, the use of the piecemeal strategy to disguise your aggressive intentions is invaluable in these political times. But in masking your manipulations, you can never go too far. So when you take a bite, even a small one, make a show of acting out of self-defense. It also helps to appear as the underdog. Give the impression your objectives are limited by taking a substantial pause between bites, exploiting people's short attention spans, while proclaiming to one and all that you are a person of peace. In fact, it would be the height of wisdom to make your bite a little larger upon occasion and then giving back some of what you have taken. People see only your generosity and your limited actions, not the steadily increasing empire you are amassing. And that was the 33 Strategies of War by Robert Greene, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. If you're a Democrat, you should vote Republican because... Aggression against others reverses into aggression against the self. The more a person contains aggression against others, the more strict and coercive the conscience becomes. The internalization of violence also proves useful to the exercise of rule. It ensures that the obedient subject internalizes the external ruling authority, making it a part of itself. This allows the authority to rule with far less effort. Symbolic violence is also a violence that makes use of the mechanism of habit. It inscribes itself within the things that are taken for granted, in habitual patterns of perception and of behavior. Violence is naturalized, as it were. Without the effort of physical, martial violence, it ensures that the established ruling relationship is maintained. The psychological internalization of force also serves disciplinary ends. By way of subtle, discrete interventions, it infiltrates the subject's neural paths and muscle fibers, subjugating it to outside ortho and neurocorrective compulsions and imperatives. The wholesale violence of decapitation, which prevails in the society of sovereignty, yields to the violence of successive subcutaneous deformation. Back in a minute. Uh, Thank you, thank you. So with regards to the decision uh, by the Supreme Court, this came down again to dueling rights, uh, the rights of the the non-existent rights of the government versus the rights of the individual. And the Supreme Court found that the individual has the rights and that the government has none, that the government has no right to prosecute. The government has the authority to prosecute, but it has no right 
to prosecute. Of course, uh, the uh, left in this country, I can't stand that, but too bad. Uh, the Supreme Court right, a Supreme Court did it right. Now, as to the uh, 6-3 majority in the Supreme Court, remember, always remember that we have a 6-3 majority of Republicans on the court thanks to a Democrat. Thanks to a Democrat named Senator Reed. He is the one, he's passed away, but he is the one that created what is known as the Reed Rule, which uh, has to do with whether or not a Supreme Court nomination can be filibustered. And he did away with the filibuster of Supreme Court nominations in order to help uh, President Obama stack the court. Okay, so, uh, and what ended up happening is it backfired. Like almost everything that the Democrats do, like almost every ill-gotten or ill-conceived uh, scheme of the Democrats, it backfired. And we now have, uh, thanks to the Reed rule, Senator Reed, a Democrat, uh, a 6-3 Republican majority on the Supreme Court. Now, if we didn't have this... Uh, bloated, ridiculous concept of government rights, it wouldn't matter what the, uh, whether the, the Supreme Court justices were Republican, Democrat, or Independent, because they'd be doing their job, which is simply to apply the law. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So in the background, there is a uh, Kentucky congressman and a lady from um, Maria Bartiromo's show. And they're talking about the border. That he had the support, the endorsement of the Border Patrol. Of course, right away they came out and they squashed that and said, absolutely, we do not. But as you know, you know, these Border Patrol agents, I mean, whether it's suicides or alcoholism or divorce rates, they as a group are really suffering because... Well, anyways, I don't know why she's going off on the suffering of the Border Patrol agents. But uh, the point I'm trying to make here is when I listen to this guy, the first one he starts talking about, I'm thinking, okay, because this is supposed to be a news show, news and analysis. So I'm thinking, okay, so he's going to provide some information, this congressman is, uh, that is going to be new to me and to the viewers. But no, he goes on and on about how the border's out of control. We already know that. Uh, he does provide some uh, he, I, he says he was at the border. He witnessed certain things. Okay, that's new, but so what? Everybody does that. And really, then, uh, my conscience is saying something's wrong here. Uh, this isn't news at all. It's something else. And when I stop and think for a second, I realize that what he's doing is simply campaigning. And this is what I'm talking about with uh, the news media that whines and complains that we vote for the same people over and over and over again, but that's because they keep promoting the same people over and over again. They're providing this guy with free campaign time. That's what he's there to do. He's not providing news. Uh, if he was providing news, he would be holding a news conference. So he's here to campaign. He's in full campaign mode, and what they should be doing is charging this guy camp, uh, whatever the advertising rates are. Charge him the advertising rates. I'm sure he has a war chest, probably a million dollars or so, so he could pay for that. And if they're going to give free airtime to anybody, they should give it to whoever his challenger is. And uh, they should encourage that. Come out on the air and say, if you're, you're somebody that wants to challenge a sitting uh, office holder, uh, let us know. We'll give you free airtime. They should do something like that. But of course they don't because two reasons, profit and self-aggrandizement so that they can uh, get some sense of prestige. There's no sense of prestige in interviewing the average citizen. But it, you, you want to be able to go home to your spouse and say, oh, I interviewed a congressman today, that kind of thing. So uh, at the, in the end, it's non-profit news now. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Donald Trump. Less than one year has passed since I first stood at this podium in this majestic chamber to speak on behalf of the American people and to address their concerns, their hopes, 
and their dreams. That night, our new administration had already taken very swift action. A new tide of optimism was already sweeping across our land. Each day since, we have gone forward with a clear vision and a righteous mission to make America great again for all Americans. Over the last year, we have made incredible progress and achieved extraordinary success. We have faced challenges we expected and others we could never have imagined. We have shared in the heights of victory and the pains of hardship. We have endured floods and fires and storms. But through it all, we have seen the beauty of America's soul and the steel in America's spine. Each test has forged new American heroes to remind us who we are and show us what we can be. We saw the volunteers of the Cajun Navy racing to the rescue with their fishing boats to save people in the aftermath of a totally devastating hurricane. We saw strangers shielding strangers from a hail of gunfire on the Las Vegas Strip. In the aftermath of that terrible shooting, we came together, not as Republicans or Democrats, but as representatives of the people. But it is not enough to come together only in times of tragedy. Tonight, I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. These are the people we were elected to serve.
deserve a government that shows them the same love and loyalty in return. We want every American to know the dignity of a hard day's work. We want every child to be safe in their home at night. And we want every citizen to be proud of this land land that we all love so much. We can lift our citizens from welfare to work, from dependence to independence, and from poverty to prosperity. As President of the United States, my highest loyalty, my greatest compassion, my constant concern is for America's children, America's struggling workers, and America's forgotten communities. I want our youth to grow up, to achieve great things. I want our poor to have their chance to rise. So tonight, I am extending an open hand to work with members of both parties, Democrats and Republicans, to protect our citizens of every background, color, religion, and creed. My duty and the sacred duty of every elected official in this chamber is to defend Americans, to protect their safety, their families, their communities, and their right to the American dream. Because Americans are dreamers too. It was a small cluster of colonies caught between a great ocean and a vast wilderness. It was home to an incredible people with a revolutionary idea that they could rule themselves, that they could chart their own destiny, and that together they could light up the entire world. That is what our country has always been about. That is what Americans have always stood for always strive for and always done we're a people whose heroes live not only in the past but all around us defending hope pride and defending the american way they sacrifice to raise a family they care for our children at home they defend our flag abroad And they are strong moms and brave kids. They are firefighters and police officers and border agents, medics and Marines. But above all else, they are Americans. And this capital, this city, this nation belongs entirely to them. Americans fill the world with art and music. They push the bounds of science and discovery and they forever remind us of what we should never ever forget the people dreamed this country the people built this country and it's the people who are making america great again as long as we are proud of who we are and what we are fighting for There is nothing we cannot achieve as long as we have confidence in our values, faith in our citizens, and trust in God. We will never fail. Our families will thrive. Our people will prosper. And our nation will forever be safe and strong and proud and mighty and free. Thank you, and God bless America. Good night.
And that was Donald Trump. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. The following is a, one of my voiceover demos. If uh, you're a voiceover artist and you would like to advertise one of your demos on my podcast, please send an MP3 to the drill12, all one word, at gmail.com. That's the drill12 at gmail.com. Back in a minute. Americans love scenery. We want to see it all, from one coast to the next. Mount Rushmore down to the Everglades. So hop into a Chevy Malibu and take the scenic route. It's the car you knew America could build. There's a place where people count on friendships they can trace back generations. Where they can count on the same stool at the coffee shop waiting for them every morning. This place is called Glen Ellen. And you can find it in every bottle of Glen Ellen wine. This is craft brewed Herman Joseph's. The smoothest, easiest drinking specialty beer in the entire solar system. And I believe you'll find drinkable in the dictionary right after Don't Order a Beer You Can't Drink. Zoingo! Boingo! The freestyle pogo with more boing, more bounce. Bounce further, bounce higher with Zoingo! Boingo! To see what makes Arrowhead Mountain Spring water different from those other waters, you have to go back to the source. And with Arrowhead, that means going back a little farther and longer than most. Between security challenged and security strengthened, there's one important word, how. And it is the how that makes all the difference to our nation and our world. Lockheed Martin, we never forget who we're working for. What makes Kraft Singles so good? Two out of every three kids don't get the recommended amount of calcium. But with Kraft Singles, they get a good source of calcium and the taste they love. Craft Singles. Magic every single time. Throw pouring overboard with a new real meal from Long John Silver's. A meal worthy of a plate, just $4.99. Only at Long John Silver's. We may not all be geniuses, but we can all do something smart. Introducing the Hyundai 199 Sonata Lease. It's a smart deal on a really smart car. This is Ron, your host, the only uh, true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there and reminding you that you are not neutral and that the government has no rights.